Hello and welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington and Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Hello, Tom. I'm terribly excited. <laughs> yes, so am I. Because we are we're really global in this episode because and we're really thrilled that we are welcoming Efrat first, who's dialing in from Jerusalem. Hello, Efrat, how are you? Hi, hello. Nice to be here. And I'm fine. Excited too. <laughs> That's great. I mean, we're, we're excited because we, we love them, um, you know, talking about teaching and the cognitive science aspect of it. Emma is the, the proud author of this extended mind in action that she, she wrote with David and Oliver, her, her co-writers. So, that you know, you're a cognitive scientist, author, Emma, aren't you? Fantastic. <laughs> so we, well, we... I, I'm, so I must say, you know how everybody sort of has um, like a gateway band or, a, you know, an entrance to something. Ephra is the very first bit of reading I did around cognitive science. So she was my oh. first dalliance <laughs> with the field. And That's amazing. Did, OK. And I, I still have got some of my very early slides with your models and work on there. So weirdly, I feel like I know you, but I've never actually we've never met <laughs> and we're, we're also thrilled that you 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 provided uh one of the walkthroughs for our volume three walkthroughs and actually i'll tell you now that it's become one i refer to in every single talk that i do okay. including one earlier because i will talk about why in a minute but it, it, it's true it's sort of it's it gives a sort of re reasoning for a bit of the kind of learning process which i just think is so brilliant and i just find that once people hear it, they go, "Oh, yeah, that, God, that makes so much sense." But let's just let's just get a bit of background to, from you. So I know that looking at your your website and everything, I only really picked this up recently that that you've moved re re fairly recently to the Moff Institute, and it says on here that it's the Centre for the research, for Research Curriculum and Program Development in Teacher Education. So that just sounds absolutely awesome. So tell us a bit about that. What what's your work involved there? Um, so yes, it's the only institute in Israel, in Israel that does that because we are small and it's the national institute. Um, and we do everything that is related to teachers' education and mostly working with the teacher colleges. Uh, in my role, I combine a few things. It's both um, research. Um, I, I'm not doing research, but I'm coordinating research or communicating research or uh, being the bridge, the, the, the place that I um, enjoy or the role that I enjoy doing for the last, uh, I don't know, uh, 13 years maybe. Um, and I also do digital pedagogy. Um, so I'm a lot of digital and technology, but uh, my role is uh, I'm the the pedagogue and everybody's coming with the questions about how to do it right and I really enjoyed it and I think that um, it's mostly a teacher's education that is higher education uh, but it's a higher education for teachers so it's always you know multi-level thinking and um, it's great it's very active uh, we're doing a lot of different things and many programs not every I, I don't do everything but I'm involved in, in a few very excited um, um, programs there so yep and i'm hoping so, to so, bring so in more a, is it a place where you know what t is it one of the places you have to go to attend to become a teacher in israel is it is it sort of so so not exactly we have those colleges and schools either in the universities or uh, dedicated colleges for teachers and we are um kind kind of an organizations that works with them and provide professional education for the educators, like the teacher teachers, teacher trainers, or, or lecturers for teachers, and, and teachers themselves. It depends on the program, but uh, it's not that teachers are not learning in our institute, but we are uh, providing services to those institutes, if it makes any sense. <laughs> that, sounds, that, sounds, that sounds so interesting. And how's it, how's it different from your previous place, the Teaching and Learning Center, which was in the University of Jerusalem? So is that is that similar? Uh, it's similar, but it's also different. Uh, so there, it's a university, so um, it's working with the lecturers uh, on their teaching and um, um, designing courses and redesigning courses mainly, uh, but working with the entire population of lecturers. So now it's more um, lecturers who, mostly lecturers who work with um, future teachers. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's diff- uh, now it's more um, focused on actual teaching, and I'm excited about it. So, Effort, you're working with um, teachers, teacher educators, quite a broad bandwidth yeah. of professionals within within your current role. What I'm really interested in is what are you really excited about in terms of what's kind of making what's keeping you awake at night but in a good way because you think this is really excited I'm, I'm really want to get to you know get into this and think about it in a bit more depth what's kind of the burning thing that's that you're thinking about at the moment um so one thing it's something that you you know better maybe um it's bringing the science of learning to these people because they don't know it and um most of them some of them do many people don't it's not part of the conversation station uh, on a daily basis uh, and I've talked to some people and they're excited about it and I'm hoping to to bring it more into the picture and it's definitely one of the things that I'm excited about it's not <laughs> currently going on but it will be uh, I, I I'm hoping to um, to have more of it uh, I do teach I have students and I teach them those um, subjects but that's not a huge part of what I do. Um, yeah. Other than that, I like uh, work. What uh, another part of the work that I really like is um, reconstructing, constructing, or redesigning courses. And this is when we take everything apart and build it anew. And then this is when I actually use those diagrams that I I work with that you mentioned before. And I always tell them I actually can see it, and I say, okay, this is missing, and we have to 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 make more of this. And this is the reason that things are not working. And this is how, um, so I'm really excited about doing it without actually um, mm. saying what are the principles, but I'm, I, I, I really enjoy this process. It's really um, challenging every time. Uh, so um, it's really great. Actually, now we are working on a special project in which we take courses that were taught within the Institute, and now they're moving into the schools. So we you're redesigning them and it's really, really exciting. So this is another thing. <laughs> I was reading one of your um your blogs actually about how you how you took some of your early work or work from a different field into that course mm-hmm. design to create that table, which was um was it Sam Sims and Harry Fletcher Wood and Sarah Cottingham's paper that you kind of integrated with your I was reading that earlier and thinking that was absolutely fascinating. Like you said, that bridge between adult education and uh, the cognitive sciences. I found it completely fascinating. I think it's, I really like this work and I actually brought it in already and uh, it was accepted really nicely. I think it's it's game changing in many ways. Um, and the realization that we have to think about those stages and then bringing the science behind them, even though it's not necessarily the science that was, it's not from education, but it's from other fields. And then building this framework that has the stages and saying, uh, we have those four stages. Uh, we propose that it's essential to go through each and every one of them, which makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, you, you maybe see the, the, the links to, to my, my thinking. And then providing enough space for people to work with. And I actually read it and I know, and, and I heard the, I heard Harry and, and Sam talking about it, that it's for teachers' education, but it's more general, of course. So, of course, in terms of what where the science comes comes from, and of course, it's teachers' education, but it's more general. The ideas are more general. And I think that I try to write it down, but I think that it's something that tells us that the entire field has matured in a way that it's go it's going to be more practical now, but not just practical that we know about retrieval practice, so we are applying it in the classroom, but in a more general way. So this is mm-hmm. something I'm definitely very excited about, and I'm going to sleep thinking about how I'm <laughs> going to, you know, organize those yeah. ideas into something meaningful. Yeah, those words again. Yeah. There's so much. Thomas, you, I mean, if, if I if I was to st- tell you that, let me tell you the thing which I am sharing from you, which which I, I find is so useful and and kind of, it, it, and then well, there's a whole layer to this, which is that I mean I you know started teaching in 1996, and I meet teachers now, like all this time later, who still 
having been through you know a teacher training process which they've had to learn quite a lot and then they've been in school there's so much to learn and lots of us have yet to kind of fully explore how memory and learning works and it's it's not sort of front and center of a teacher training process for a lot of people even still and you might argue that it ought to be but I'm, I'm finding there's a lot of lot of material, a lot of mileage in talking to teachers about this, these stages. And so in your diagrams, you have this fantastic kind of, I don't know what, what you would call it, no. It depends, there are different ways you call it, but that kind of initial encoding of an idea. Yeah. And getting children to just, oh, like, or, or it could be an adult, to just have an idea and it, to sort of take some form, of form in, your, in your memory. So it has to kind of get in there. And then you link it to stuff you already know, which can constitute some understanding. And this is the bit where I find it's just quite a breakthrough for people. Is unless that's happened, unless that's happened, those two steps, there's no point in setting them a quiz like a week later saying, guys, can you see if you remember that thing you did last week? <laughs> because there's nothing for them to remember. There's like that initial encoding and connecting has to happen, doesn't it? I mean, is that is I mean that sounds very simple, but I could come up with millions of examples of that where some children are doing that. So the teacher thinks, hey, this is going nicely. Right. A whole bunch of other kids aren't. And they're just in the room going, what's happening? So, I mean, do you have lots of, of that experience that you're sharing with people? So, again, what's, what's the question? Like, that, like you where know, does... the, the experiences, like specific learning instances, like there's a sort of abstraction with the diagrams that you share. But do you have instances where you've seen these things happen where you're saying to your students the this is how it looks in practice so first um i'm thinking two things at the same time first where it comes from and for me it comes very naturally because this was my you know uh, education i was working when i was doing cognitive science in the lab i was working in a lab that was actually looking at those memory traces and encoding and consolidation and retrieval were the words that we were using all the time. So this is how I think about memories. And then it become useful to other people. And this has made me um, very happy that I can actually share it. And my experience has been mainly, well, my most direct association is, is new words in a language, because this is something that I'm obviously um, busy thinking about and I was working with language teachers quite a lot and and words but then so, so words are, are the main example and you actually can and, and I was conscious about me doing that you know listening to a word that I've never heard before and then hearing the same word again and then the third time okay I need to figure out what this word means so I was actually been able to see this this process happening uh, I was conscious about it uh, and then you can see in other people, I'm talking about those uh, concepts, retrieval practice, for example, or whatever it is, encoding or reconsolidation. And you can see sometimes people asking you again the same question. And yeah, I just said it. Wasn't it clear? And then you figure <laughs> out, no, it wasn't. You have to. It, it's the process of people figuring, figuring it out. Um, so these instances, um, I think it just, it just links to what you just said, that you think you teach something, but then um that's, that's so, that doesn't that's mean so, that okay. <laughs> like the content the content that you are thinking about is actually the the very meat the very material which explains the process which they're engaging in it's like wow so it's that that's that's really mind-blowing like actually encoding the idea of encoding it's <laughs> encoding the idea of encoding yeah <laughs> it's like, like a mirror good. within a mirror within a mirror <laughs> yeah that's my life in every moment we always you know talk about teachers learning and then about their students learning and then how we model good te teaching for the teachers to learn and you know it's uh, um, so, yeah, it's and does that resonate with metacognition you times three <laughs> exactly metacognition cubed yeah so what, so what was your gateway emma what was your gateway oh, what, the, the gateway the kind of the aha moment was when i was reading the kind of the earlier stuff about the know, understand, use, master model. And it, I was looking at it through the lens of curriculum and what goes into a curriculum. And I was thinking that so often 
the teaching of the curriculum stops at the understand stage and there's not space within the curriculum to then do the kind of the use and the master one and then the more I started to read about it the more I'm thinking oh my goodness this has got implications for lesson design sequence design for curriculum content for curriculum organization sequencing and so I kind of fell down an effort first shaped rabbit hole (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and fell in love with the whole kind of no understand you master model which I think is so unbelievably useful not just for thinking about how students learn but also thinking about how we plan the sequences and then leave space for those processes to happen I don't know whether I've completely got the wrong end of the stick with that or whether that's what you intended it for it to be used or yeah well definitely and I think also to link back to um to the, the meta-analysis that was just mentioned before, it's the same idea that we are so in love with explaining and teaching and organizing, which is incredibly important. And right, nothing can happen without those concepts first and those explanations seconds and the examples and the modeling and everything. But this stuff, we love it. We are conscious about it. We are aware of it. We enjoy organizing because when things click, it's really, really nice, but the job um, does not end there. And what I see now most clearly is that we have a lot of biases. And actually, nowadays, I think that those biases that we have um, are the reason to talk about cognitive cognitive science, because we have to be aware, for example, for this exact for for this exact exact thing we love explaining but then we underestimate both and i say we both as teachers and as students we underestimate uh because of understandable reasons um that the work doesn't end there and in order to make something actually meaningful it has to be useful because this is how the brain works because only when i think that the real aha moments comes after you use things well, you sit in the in the class and you say, "Okay, okay, that's that's that makes sense." So, but unless you're actually using it in any case, and it can be really dry at the, at the beginning, you know, just um, an exercise or an example or something like that that you do, it's only the first time that you signal your brain, "Oh, this is something that you need to keep because it might be useful again." So, yeah, I so- really, yeah. So this is, I think, the link that is missing, and this is. As, as I said before, it's also the reason that I really like the, this model that says you have to do at least one thing from each and every step of the way until really embedding it in your daily practice, which is... I just had a thought that might be completely okay. wrong. <laughs> you can correct me on this. You know, you said, well, as teachers, we like the first two bits. We like explaining. We like doing this. But then as the student you feel that sense of accomplishment when you use and master what you've been learning. So is there a misalignment between when you kind of get your notional dopamine hit, you get your dopamine hit as a teacher and, aha, I'm explaining really well, but actually the learner gets their hit further down the line. I think, I've learned it, I can use it. Is there a kind of a two-tier I think so, but but also there is a huge, you know, heel in between because for the learners to get to the point that they get this, dopamine (laughs) Uh, they have to do something that they don't want to do or that they don't think that they need to do and Mm -hmm. this is where the bias comes in the I I like to call it sometimes the short-term long-term paradox or I I know it is also called the stability bias or something like that that we think that if I had just understood it then okay I'm good to go because it it feels good but Mm -hmm. so there is a really really um I don't know yeah I I also always draw it as a uh, hill that you have to climb in order to get to the other side yeah. and it's really the thing that we have to work with a lot and you know many times probably when if I go to a lecture and, and present this diagram for the first time so people say oh now I get it so we have to tell the students that they have to practice or whatever it is and I say no you can tell them a hundred times it won't happen it's your responsibility to to actually embed it into your lesson plan curriculum whatever it is um, so, so this is something what, that yeah what, what i find people then will say is that you know doesn't this take time and, and i think that people get anxious about that but i, I feel like so what, what my experience of this and they am i interpreting this wrongly that even that first stage the kind of no stage um where you're just encoding i, I actually think that's the weakest part of the whole process because 
in a class of say 30 children is that the fact that I have said something to you like um oh I don't know I'm just I could I could pick something up like here's here's a coin this coin is made of iron or something let's say it is you know which they should have heard of or this is a circle yeah and so you think you've said it into the ether into the room the assumption you make is so you should all know that now <laughs> and then let's move on to another thing and i and, and yeah and that you can use it to explain the, the next thing um, yeah they're going what, what what so it's that assumption that the encoding is happening kind of as we talk or as we show but but we but that's so often that's not true is i mean so for me that it's never mind the using it's like let's get the encoding happening that's my sense of, what do you, does that make sense to you i really think it's a very important uh, idea and I, I see whatever you describe it's really something that that repeats that okay i introduce you to new concepts and then i just use them to, in order to explain something more uh, complex and it's a real problem there and i think that the most um the the great idea that i love to introduce into the section exactly is meyer's um pre-training principle uh, and meyer has a, a list of uh, a growing um a growing list of principles about and uh, in his cognitive theory of multimedia learning and the principle says that if you're going to teach something it's better if you introduce a new concept in advance and um separately that means that before a lesson starts you have to or even at home or as homework from from last time uh, it's advised to to actually students or your whoever your learners are to learn those concepts as you know something that is you can call it dry or very basic but it's an important stage that this principle mm -hmm. tells us about um so definitely and when i talk about the no principle i usually talk about um reduce distractions um focus and then introduce uh, concepts new concepts in advance and separately which is really important i think it's a it's a very powerful principle definitely mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's that I can think of lots of applications of that. And um, it's getting people to, re do, you, do you think talk is a big factor of this? Because this is this is one of my feelings, like, like okay, can you assume? So here's, here's my feeling is that apart from the fact that talk flush, you know, um, makes public what you're thinking. So in a class situation, we need to check people learning that you can hear it and then engage with it before it's sort of written. Um, but of course, adults and more sophisticated learners might do all of it mentally but one of the things i'd like to encourage is teachers sort of, or children getting to sort of run through like just talk it through for me so what do you think this is mm. and what's happened here so they have to kind of rehearse the idea even though the information is still there they have to talk it out now, do you, to me that's am I, is that a sensible idea or is that am i kidding myself just because i can hear it that that means it's it's better i think that if someone is using the term then it's a signal that the term was encoded and maybe even consolidated. It reminded me of um, this really nice fact from uh, Annie Murphy's poem, uh, The Extended Mind, when she ex talks about those gestures that comes before uh, students actually understand. So this is something real. I think it's it's related because if someone is talking to you and then say oh, this thing or those, and 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 the concept is not there yet, then. This is when you can sense, and I think she really makes a nice point there. This is when you can sense that this is not uh, ripe yet, and you have to to wait for it to happen. But if I a have... student uses it in a sentence, then you know it's there. Yeah, yeah. I, I would I've just been talking about that this afternoon. I've literally oh. done a whole staff meeting on gestural foreshadowing this afternoon. <laughs> this bit was I... so interesting. Yeah, oh, it's fascinating because the, the bit where she says about the fact that it's that mismatch between the gesture right. and the speech, where children or the learner is most receptive to instruction. And that that's the bit that we should be looking out for. So yes, you can listen to whether they're competent and you know with, with the words in their mouths, but are they competent with the concept they're holding in their hands at the same time? And, yeah. and if there's that mismatch, that's when you dive in with that uh, either additional instruction or questioning or whatever. But, oh, a fellow Annie Murphy Paul fan. <laughs> 
So I, like I think um, so. I think you just build a sequence there where Tom says, if they are able to speak about it, then they they bridge the gap. But if they're not there yet, then we might be able to sense this uh, sensitive, uh, teachable moment that we can mm -hmm. use. Yeah, definitely. Ah, so awesome. you know, one, one of the things I, I do in my training is like a question. I don't know. I, I'm a science teacher, so I'm biased towards science questions. But me too. I, I found this a question that I like. Uh, to, to get teachers to ask, which is, why does the sun rise in the east? And I, I've, I've hit on that one because over the years I've found that most people kind of have an idea of that, but they don't always know really well how to explain it. And so there's a difference between sort of knowing and then, th so if someone said to you, do you think you know why the sun rises in the east? People will say, yeah, but actually, God, when they actually have to explain it, they go, oh, okay. Yeah. And then, so I do that question. And when, when you've got a room full of people doing that, and I get them to do it in a pair so that everyone's doing it, and immediately you get this room full of people kind of offloading their memory into these sort of their hand is, sometimes it's, people use a bottle on the table, yeah. or their hand is the earth, and they're starting to go, which way does it go? And they're, they're externalising, they're creating this sort of visual space for them to think about the whole scenario with their hands. And I love watching that. <laughs> Because they're kind of mentally rehearsing, and that is so brilliant. You imagine if they had to do it with their hands tied behind. Oh, their Tom, that's <laughs> one of my. That is the task that I use in my training. I've got a list of things to explain. Well, I say, right, explain it to your colleague, but you have to have your hands around your back. And what it looks like is a nature documentary about seals, because everybody then starts doing <laughs> going back and forth with their hands behind their back. <laughs> that's great, isn't it? So actually you're touching here, I think, because I'm now busy with thinking about and mapping illusions because I really got to the conclusion that this is what stops us from doing the right things sometimes. And this is the illusion of understanding uh, we have uh, that we experience a lot. Uh, and until we tried to use this information to do something that is useful, that gets you know a feedback from our environment or which is the people that we talk to, we didn't really understand it. So it actually means that we have to, and, and back to your question, Emma, about how to find space in, the, in, in, in every program uh, in order, to, we have to test everything. We have to make sure that things are really meaningful only by trying them out. Otherwise, um, it, it all connects back to those things, I think. <laughs> I think there are different ways. I mean, I, I've I've had people, you know, people react to ideas differently. It depends on their subject context. And, you know, I, I wrote a blog about that, um, needed to get people to exp explain more uh, in lessons. And, and some math teachers sort of took umbrage about that because they felt like, you know, in maths, you can show your understanding through just repeated practice and, you know, pen and paper, and you don't have to talk it out. You, mm -hmm. I can show I understand maths without having to do a big whole class presentation or because you can. And that's true. But it's a kind of, so in other words, you can show your understanding in multiple ways. And I think it's important to put a subject context around that because there are, they obviously have to be broad minded about this stuff. But there are some things there where, what I love when cognitive science provides a kind of a diagnostic. Uh, and for me, one yeah. of the main diagnostics is this whole thing of the, the sum and the, and the all. It, it, the hardest thing about teaching is teaching everybody. <laughs> right. You, you, it's hard to get feedback in real time from everyone as they're processing and even to structure things so they can all participate and everything. It's, it's actually quite demanding. So that illusion of understanding is, you know, that the classic kind of, has everyone got that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, another thing. I, yeah. I, I was thinking it. about it as the nodding effect. The oh, nodding. Sorry. You know that it's enough to have two nodding heads in the classroom for you to feel good and, and think that you can go on. Yeah. Oh, isn't it funny? Some some teachers are hilariously grateful that somebody knows something. They go, Oh yes, Stephen, thank you. And Stephen can go on. And, on. <laughs> and everyone else is going, What's he on about? Yeah. But I'll ask you about a couple of other ideas though, concepts, because there are some, a couple of gems. I mean, you know, we only have so, so much time, but one of the what a couple of things I've picked up from you. Well, one of them is prediction mm. and the role that plays uh, in supporting learning so can you say a bit about that so what why does why is prediction or getting students to predict things are, are so useful well 
again, because I think it's something very basic that we do all the time uh, naturally. We predict that things will happen and then we either confirm or not. Uh, so it's, you know, the predictive brain, and a lot have been said about that. It's a very natural way. And there is a lot of very interesting research uh, on prediction. And I felt that the research was not, uh, um, I still feel that way, is not communicated to teachers as well as a lot of other subjects, like retrieval practice, for example. And there are a lot of very interesting uh, ideas there that um, most of us can can understand because we have the, the prior knowledge and the background. So is it is it right that, that, that this is where I get I got a little bit confused with it because at one point I was thinking that it's almost more helpful if you're wrong in your prediction than if you're right because then you sort of go oh why am I wrong and then it gets you involved. But if you're right, you just sort of kind of can kind of lazily just go yeah 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 I know it. And so is that but but then obviously being right is also a, an advantage. So how does that work? Is that too much? So there is research about it, actually. And there are two ways to go. And if your prediction is confirmed, then um, you learn better. Okay, we learn better things that we already know. So you learn quicker, and you understand better, because you it's automatically linked to your schema, if you will. So this is and I think there are even uh, evidence for the fact that this goes in 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 different uh, neural pathways. So there is some research into that. So if you understand, it's it's one pathway and it's the network that uh, takes care of those ideas that we already know um, to strengthen them. But then if it's new, then it's another um, it's it's another mode of alertness. OK, something is not working the way I predicted. It means that I need to learn. So it's, it's the basic trigger for learning. Uh, and this is where um we are actually very alert because something is not working it's like you know think about an animal that it uh, goes through a pathway to find water and then it's um they, they can't go i don't know there is a bear or uh someone so, some kind of danger uh, so they have to relearn the pathway to save their lives so it's the same uh just in the classroom yeah wow. I like it. We have to reframe our maths questions, Emma. It's like <laughs> reframe the rework the path to save your life. Yeah, but it is the, it, the, it is it is right. It is powerful, and this is what we do. Everything that we learn, every time that we learn something new, uh, we change something. So, in a sense, is those same ideas uh, of uh, constructivist uh, learning of. of um, assimilation and then i forgot the other one um i talked about him so much in hebrew that i forgot the the english <laughs> yeah. i think of the translation i remember yeah um, is it about um, that kind of is the best point to be at then kind of on the cusp of understanding as in so it could go one way it could go the other way so yeah. you kind of just on that precipice of I might need to do some new learning or this might just be something I understand. Is that the is that the sweet spot then? Yeah. Uh, kind of neural pathway creation. So so it is uh, both, you know, you, you, you talked, you just mentioned the neural pathway, but when you're talking, I was imagining a, a classroom scenario. And if I'm as someone who taught that content before, I sometimes know where these points are and then I can celebrate them in a way by introducing a question just there deciding you know i have a classroom i have a limited number of questions that i can use through a lesson because it's time consuming and whatever and then these are the spots when i would i i, I know that i need to choose to use the question there in order to make the most of this um learning moment so but that, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think a natural. I mean, I, I, this is probably instinctive to a storyteller. Like a, a lot of primary school teachers, are, they, they, they get good at storytelling because they do it a lot, and it's very common as a science teacher to. to I love it when you watch a, a primary teacher and they always do this. So everybody, what do we think is going to happen next? And it's the kind of that kind of predicting what's going to happen next is a very natural thing to do as a storyteller, isn't it? I mean, but you might not be thinking why. It just feels instinctive to ask. Well, you know, storytelling is something that a lot of people learn how to do well. But, you know, as a science teacher, for example, it's maybe it's the most, um, the easiest example. You are about to just demonstrate something. 
right? Something is going to happen and you know that it's going to be surprising, okay? A lot of examples, something falls or something burns and, and whatever. So if you just stop just before this surprising moment and you ask those learners to predict, so the entire experience, even if it's just a video, is, is amplified because everybody has to predict. And if I know that there's some misconception and that students are likely to predict in a wrong way, then I I use the question in the best way. So not ask before and don't ask after, but ask just in this moment before the surprising uh, um, moment is, is about to happen. Uh, so definitely so science is, it, is the easiest, I think. <laughs> is it about thinking about... Uh, your subject or your lesson or your sequence as well, I suppose, like a like a story, like a narrative then, and thinking about yeah. the cliffhanger moment. And exactly. going, right, yeah. <laughs> identify the cliffhanger moment. This is where we predict. Yes. Just like good storytellers, they, you know, they use all those ways to just introduce it in a in in a in an suspenseful way and it's the same. Yeah. And then bang, we have to wait until tomorrow to find out. <laughs> <laughs> So you won't see the, the, you know, the next bit of the video before you answer this question. Yeah. And then yeah. say, oh, but then it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. well, that's funny because there, there are some video pr- programmers, which I, and I, I won't name them because I, they, they, that would be mean, but there were some um, maths video programs where the students are, uh, it just says press pause and then do the sum. And then, and then, and then the next second it tells the answer. But if you're 15 and you're a bit, you just, you just carry on <laughs> watching because you just think, you of know course. the answer. <laughs> Even if you're older than 15, you carry on watching. Yeah, yeah. You just yeah. cheat yourself, don't you? Yeah. Let, let, let me ask you about the other thing. The other thing I was going to say was just, I, 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 I don't know, until you explain this, I'd never heard of it and never thought about it, was this idea of reconsolidation. And to me, this hmm. is just absolutely mind-blowing, really, which is that, and the, and the way I've explained this in some of my training, so you tell me if you think this sounds sensible, is that to get people to imagine uh, I say, like, Matt, what did you do last Saturday? Uh, you, like, you know, what did you do? You know, where, where did you wake up? Um, who else was there? <laughs> was it a surprise? You know, I, that's my joke. A bit brave but, uh, of a Saturday morning to ask people. <laughs> what did you have for breakfast? You know, when did you go out? You know, and, and people are sort of thinking, oh, God, I don't know. I mean, it was just a regular Saturday. But then I say, so imagine you were there with your partner. They would, between you, you could have pieced together the true story of kind of what you where you were and now you've remembered that saturday the act of remembering it is part of the memory of the saturday so when you that reconsolidates back into your memory of saturday this stuff you've done now is now part of that so but if you've misremembered and if you've now remembered that you had the tea instead of coffee or whatever now and that's not corrected that goes back into your memory <laughs> So there's a kind of danger then of like misremembering and not correcting it, isn't it? So that's a huge pitfall. How, how do we deal that, with that as teachers? Well, first I have to say that this idea was the first one. Well, the lab that I was working in in my PhD was researching this idea in the level of the neurons and uh, and wow. the, the behaving animals. So they actually proved this this idea that before people thought that if you learn something, then the connections are made and then they're encoded and consolidated and they're there for long-term memory, okay? But then some experiments didn't work the way people expected. And so, and when they looked at more carefully, they found out that actually when we use or retrieve the information, the actual trace, and we know it in a biological way, the actual trace is becomes malleable and in a way it's it's in a in a stage that it waits for new directions so if it's um and it's related to what we talked before about prediction so if it's confirmed then it's it's one pathway but if it's it's an opportunity to change something okay and so this was you know the field of research that i was immersed in and this is when i first learned about this the testing effect okay the testing effect is the idea that we when you retrieve something, you actually strengthen the memory and it fits perfectly. And this is the first time when I thought, okay, here is the link between neuroscience 
and education. Um, so this is the idea, and it happens all the time. We, we're reconsolidating things every time we're doing retrieval practice, okay? So this is the link. This is why the strength, you know, people talk about the those pathway strengthening, because it's true. Mm -hmm. Every time we retrieve something, it's ready for a change. And if we learn something new that is correct, then it's going one way. But if we learn something new that is incorrect, then we are messing with the trace. Um, in a good way or in a bad way. So this is how it works. So, so for me, it's um, this is maybe the, the first thing that I wanted to draw uh, to, to show this idea. And I think it goes back to everything that we, talk, we talked about today, uh, right from encoding to, and, and especially a uh, retrieval and, and, and prediction and reconsolidation. So, I think it's a very basic idea. Uh, sometimes we take it, take it for granted, but this is how it happens. Do you know what I'm think. thinking about, Tom? And again, I don't know if I've got the wrong idea. Imagine that initial trace, uh, sorry, that initial encoding as an ice cube. And then when we retrieve it, it goes to water and it could go back to the right shape of an ice cube, but it could be frozen in the shape of something else. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so it's that kind of malleable state in the middle where it's watery where it could go back and be solid ice again or it could be shaped something or just disappear entirely yeah. like vapor <laughs> so we don't know about that but yes definitely so this is the idea that whenever it's active whenever we use something and these this is why these ideas are so powerful about retrieval practice and you and using the ideas and why using is so important for understanding and for ma making meaning because this is where it's our opportunity to play with it. And, you know, it goes to research takes it to curing um, phobias and, and, and anxiety and all those mm -hmm. kinds of things or, or you know, uh, post-traumatic memories. Okay, this is how people are thinking about treating them and succeeding in, in many in many. It's very, yes, very basic. And if it can go, go through something and make it a positive experience, you you learn you relearn that that's it's actually a positive thing rather than a different thing. And and, and again, I feel like I keep I know I feel like I stuck wreck on this, but that process needs to be happening for everyone in the room. So when you're yeah. when you're getting students to re retrieve a memory, that that making meaning for them, they've got to be able to sort of almost like hearing themselves think or rehearsing, bringing it out so that they can create that malleability otherwise you end up with fixed learning but it doesn't it lead to the thing so there's a there's a fantastic part of graham nuttall's hidden lives of learners where he talks about the children around the table sort of unheard by the teacher at the time but captured on the microphones on the table where they kind of say something to each other like well my dad says blah 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 <laughs> some total nonsense <laughs> And that's part of the learning. That's part of their their day at school. That Michael's dad says, yeah. and that's stuck in their head, and that becomes their fact, which might be <laughs> utterly spurious. <laughs> that explains that as well, doesn't it? It's so interesting. Yeah, you know, it, it's related. Not that I often think about it, but me. Sometimes you wonder why some students understand better, and then I think about it. If they have a habit of retrieving things and explaining things to themselves, you know, um, implicitly. But if they have this habit and this is, if this, this is the way they think, then um, they have more opportunities of retrieval and, and, and reconsolidation. So they learn better, but this is only because of their habits of thinking. So when people mm -hmm. talk about habits of thinking, this is what I think about. And sometimes I see those, um, I see those examples in classrooms, you know, you know, when you ask someone to rehearse, different people do different things. And those different things um, actually um, implicate the way or how how well or the quality of their the learning and this is exactly these points uh, that's so interesting well i'm, I'm getting i'm getting the, the signal from our one <laughs> user that we, we're we're kind of coming towards the end so i'm gonna have to wrap it up soon i could just talk to you forever about it i mean it's like a, a sort of super nerd fest we're talking to sarah cottingham soon so we're going to carry oh, on soon. okay so you'll do uh, yeah <laughs> this is this is the this for me this is just like i love it but can I ask you a couple of questions just to, for people picking up on you? So we've we've already mentioned your your teaching with learning in mind blog, which is right. brilliant. 
Are you coming to the UK anytime? Are you doing any research ad events or anything like um, that? I am doing a research ad in Warrington in April, but I'm not, I don't think I will come. I don't know yet, but I think it will be uh, remotely. And I definitely have to to start thinking about it. Yeah, um, I don't have plans, but I need to make some plans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, if, if you come to Research Ed in September in London, you'll have a massive audience because <laughs> I'll be in the front row. Might have to book the O2. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I I actually thought that after, you know, um, uh, following from um, very remotely, but very closely on Twitter on uh, last year's, I think that it might be a good idea. I, I was really uh, jealous and I think I should uh, <laughs> think about it seriously. <laughs> yeah, well, if, you can make the, if you can make the flight, make the journey. Um, but anyway, look, honestly, I wanted to say a huge thank you. We, we're going to have to stop there, but it's just such a joy talking to you. You're so knowledgeable. And uh, it's, I love the way you you are like embodiment of this bridge between research and practice. And you're so, uh, so you, you've got such a su- subtle understanding of that. It's brilliant. And it's so helpful to so many of us. We Everyone raves about you. Kind of, it's just like, oh, my God, have you read the latest thing? So Hi. thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real honour. <laughs> Oh, so thank you so much. It's been a privilege and I didn't even um, made all the connections that I wanted to do with the thing that I've read about your work, which I think is amazing. Um, But yes, thank you so much for having me. And I hope you got everything because I saw that our line wasn't perfect. So apologies for that. And I hope we have uh, more opportunities. Yeah, we will definitely talk again. So thank you so much. and thanks to everyone listening. I just want to say a uh, big thanks on, on behalf of me and Emma. We're pleased that this episode and the one before, we now have over 100,000 listens to Mind the Gap <laughs> since we started. Um, so we, we're blown away. So thank you so much for listening and uh, keep keeping us going. We, we, we love doing this. So that's been uh, Efrat First, a wonderful guest uh, on Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe uh, with me and Emma. And we'll see you, see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you.